Dear Lord, I just ask that you'd be with us this evening. Mm -hmm. and that you would send your angel and Holy Spirit to be here and give Suzanne your words and the mind of Christ. Thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. So I asked everybody for um, nice words about this class, but I actually got a letter from somebody this week, uh, not this week, a couple, couple weeks back, who you know said you're a big hypocrite, you talk about agape love. It's okay, it's okay, don't worry. You talk about agape love, but you're the worst example of it. And I, I hope that in this class we've made something clear. Um, uh, when Abraham Lincoln was in office, he had a reporter come up to him and say, you know, one of your cabinet members thinks you're just a big, what was the word, Brian? Bumbling, Bumbling idiot. Is that true? And Abraham Lincoln said, uh, well, I know so-and-so to be an honorable man. If he said it, it must be so. Um, so I hope in this class it's, it's come across that um, I am in kindergarten when it comes to these things. We all are. We're all lacking the agape love that we need. And there's only one example of true agape love, and that's Jesus. And, you know, I am lacking agape love. We all are lacking agape love. We need it. We need it to, to come and flood us. And so even walking around camp meeting, um, I learned kind of a really good analogy uh, for walking in the spirit that's really helped me. And I was using it walking around camp meeting to you know, get the right bus driver on board. You know, I, I would tell myself this. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just give you something to keep in mind because we're going to keep referring to it throughout the whole class. So let's say we all want to go on a trip from Northern California to Southern California. The trip's too far for one bus driver to drive, so we have two bus drivers. Uh, the first driver is very reckless, and he takes the corners on two wheels. Uh, our hearts are beating really fast. You know, we're all terrified. We can't sing. We can't relax. We can't enjoy our time because this bus driver is reckless going around the bend. I mean, he just speeds on ahead. So halfway through the trip in Central California, the bad bus driver lets the good bus driver take over. It's the same bus, the same people in it, but it has a new driver. And he's very careful. He's very slow. He's very thoughtful. Uh, we sit back. We can talk. We can sing. We can visit with each other because it's just relaxing. The difference is not the bus. The difference is the driver. Christianity is exchanging the old driver for the new driver. It's not I, but Christ. The new driver will use the same body, the same hands, the same legs, and, uh, you know, we're same legs that went about doing everything for itself, but now everything is to glorify the Father in heaven with the new bus driver. That is Christianity. That is what Paul is talking about in every book that he wrote in the New Testament. The problem comes because when the new driver takes over, the bad bus driver doesn't get off the bus. He's in the back of the bus, and he does not like the new bus driver. The bad bus driver tells the new bus driver to speed up. You're going too slow. Let me take care of this. If I was driving, we'd get there faster. He even sometimes tries to attack the new bus driver to gain control of the bus. But the new driver is just calm and sweet and just drives the bus so that everyone is happy. This is a perfect picture of the battle between the flesh and the spirit. Uh, you can find this in Galatians 5. And this battle uh, goes on until the day we die. Until or until Christ comes and this corruption puts on incorruption. Uh, what I like about this analogy, and I told you I was using it a lot during, um, and I'm just using it now all the time, um, and saying, I, I, you know, Lord, be my bus driver. I have the wrong bus driver. I'll catch myself having a thought, and I'll be like, I got the wrong bus driver is driving. And the, I love that analogy because it's not a single sports car where it's just a two-seater. Uh, it's a bus full of people who are all affected by what bus is in charge of the bus. And if you're like me, you can tell when the bad bus driver is driving the bus because um, 
they, you know, my children will give me the look like, uh, you know, and I, I, you know, you know, you could tell people's faces when you're, when you're in the flesh. Some, some people can't, but, you know, that's where faith comes in in the morning, really asking the Lord to indwell us. And the good bus driver uh, doesn't get out and beat the bus up and kick the tires because the bus was going too fast or the bus didn't take the right turn. Well, the bad bus driver will get out and kick the tires and get mad at the bus for the bad bus, bad bus behavior. But what's the problem of bad bus driving? The driver. It's the bus driver. And that's like my body is not sinful. It's my heart and my mind controlling the body. Because this body in the spirit can do righteous acts. So Jesus, he was controlled by his father, and he was righteous. And so it's not this body that's causing the problem. You'll, you're, you can read that in Galatians 5. Our problem is in the heart and the mind, who we allow to drive our bus. We cannot produce a people who are safe for victory, for heaven, for glory land, um, by pushing legalism, by pushing people and saying, Unless you overcome sin, you'll not be able to meet the Lord. Um, that's the devil's way. Through fear and threatening. And, and you'll see that. It's or the hellfire and brimstone. The way to produce a people who will reflect Christ is to anchor them on the doctrine of genuine justification by faith. Being declared righteous because of Christ, not because of us. It's the whole message is not I, but Christ. The fruits will take care of themselves because it's a response in pure gratitude for what Christ has done for me. That's where the joy and the energy will come from. Um, and I'm not saying that we just, Christ you know, died for me and therefore I, I could just do whatever I want now. Because grace doesn't, that's not what grace is for. Grace, the definition, the biblical definition of grace is the power and the strength to do God's will. And God's will is that I overcome an overcomer. But what happens when I sin? Do I beat up the bus? Let me tell you, the quickest way I know that I'm depending on self-righteousness is when I'm looking at somebody else and I'm finding what's wrong with them or when I'm in the other ditch and I'm finding what's wrong with me and I'm sitting there just, it's a self-focus either way you go. It's two ditches. So, week one was it's not about you and it's not about me. It's about Jesus. It doesn't matter how I feel. It matters how Jesus feels and what he did in human flesh. Um, I want to ask you if you think, and I asked this before, that when Jesus was on the cross, he felt close to his father. He felt his father. I know he felt far away from his father, and that was the time when, when the Father was cloaked in darkness and the closest to him. And that's why we can't depend on our feelings because our feelings will lead us astray. Um, then week two was justification means that I am declared righteous. Failure does not mean that my justification card is revoked and that I've lost everything. I never had anything to begin with because I was so holy. Um, it's not I, but Christ. When I make a mistake, I'm to turn to my Father, get up, put on Jesus, and keep moving forward. I can't beat the bus up. Like, I, I love to beat the bus up because it's still a self-focus. I'm still focused on me. Oh, Hi. Oh, it's okay. No problem. So um, when I make a mistake, I'm to turn to Father, get up, put on Jesus, and keep moving forward. Uh, what God declares righteous, he will make righteous. And this is something, like, I want to be perfect. I mean, that's just my personality. I want to be, I want, I want it now. I, I want, I don't want to make these mistakes that I make. I don't want to have the, the responses that I have. Um, so I always picture the seed experience. Ellen White talks about training your children in the garden because it's the perfect example of the gospel. The seed experience, it grows steadily, imperceptibly, and I shouldn't be looking at my, I mean, really what I want to see is a holy person, and that's wrong. I want to look in the mirror, and I want to see somebody that's made it, you know, and that's never going to happen, because the closer I get to Jesus, I'm going to look at the perfect example, and I'm going to always want to be more and more and more and more and more like him. 
So it's really encouraging to me that you know, I'm never going to get this really perfect because it's, it ha I have to be perfect in Christ and it's totally different than what we think behaviorally. So it's, but it's God from beginning to end. The seed, he waters the plant, he keeps the plant growing. Uh, we merely give him, now this is an important part, he merely, we merely give him our will and our consent. Uh, we're in a constant state of submitting to the will of God. We are, okay, Lord, I, today I consent for you to live your life in me. I consent, I submit. When he comes and convicts, convicts me and tells me this has got to go, okay, Lord, you know, um, and, and that's my experience. Um, so week three is I agree to let Christ take every situation and put the cross into it. Uh, so in situations of conflict and hurt, uh, where the enemy is shooting his darts at, at me, I agree to have the right bus driver uh, to bring into situations the cross and let him make the water sweet again so that his glory shines in me. And that's our, that's our goal. You see that in the whole sanctuary message. Look, you, then you get to the holy, most holy place. What's in the most holy place? It's where God is glorified. And that's what we want for our own experience, is for God to be glorified. Not I, but Christ. So I step forward in faith, knowing that when I come to the cross, I have his mighty armor on now. It's a faith experience. Then week four, we went over, I have a brother and an advocate who sympathizes with me in every step of my life. I do not possess a spirit of fear towards God. And if I'm, a, if I'm having an experience of fear, um, uh, I could take comfort in the fact that I, I don't have the right picture of God right now. Because when we make a mistake, we think God is like us, that we get a spanking now and we, we need to be punished and God's mad at us and God's not like us. Um, it's, it's, it's different. When my child makes a mistake, um, do I want them to run away from me or run to me? I want my children to run to me when they make a mistake. And that that's, that's you know, our, should be our Christian experience, should be what we're doing. Um, God is not trying to keep us out of heaven. He's trying to get us all into heaven. Um, so week five was the pagan idea of love. So every pagan religion and all history is usually based on the premise of human beings looking or seeking after a god or gods. Agape love is God seeking after man. So this idea of God's agape love blows my mind. It blows my mind. There's so much depth there. And I just, I can't wait to go in deeper a little bit on, on that in another week because it's just, it's really, we struggle, we struggle to grasp and we're just grasping tiny concepts of his agape love. And remember, I confidently offered $10,000 to whomever could give me an example in scripture of the sheep going and search for the shepherd. I confidently offered that because there is no example in scripture of the sheep going in search for the shepherd. It's always the shepherd going in search for the sheep. Um, man going in search for God is a pagan idea. It's God who comes in search of us. This is agape. So if I went outside right now and I picked up a rock and I brought it in here and I said, you know, I want you guys, someone to pay me $10,000 for this rock, I'll sell it to you, you'd say, you're, you're nuts. I could go out there and I could pick up, this rock is useless, I could pick up any other rock just like it right out there. Why would I pay 10 grand for your rock? Well, if I took that rock and I was like this, like this baby here and I just loved that rock until it was pure gold, that's agape love and then you would pay me anything for that rock. It would be valuable. And that's what God does with us. He, he comes in search for us. He comes and he loves us when we're, we're not, I mean, we're a hopeless mess. And he loves us and he loves value into us. And that's what we can actually, when we've got agape love living in us, we can do with other people. Um, it's a creative power. It goes in search for the lost. It's unconditional. It's not dependent on our value. It's sovereign. It has no fear. And the best example or pinnacle of this agape love is Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, 
Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Remember Peter's experience as a Hebrew, seeing Christ on the cross with Hebrew eyes? He saw someone hanging on a tree, cursed, dying the second death for us. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit, which is what we're talking about tonight, of the Spirit through faith. And when we see this agape love and spend time looking at, the, looking at it, we're going to be transformed. And this is, this, this is the only way to do Christianity. You can't do it any other way or else it's not Christianity. It's, it's religion void of Christ, which um, religion void of Christ, I write about in my book, is no different than witchcraft. So if you have um, like Wicca and, and the different religions that I got involved with, they always, especially in the occult, you always want the religion, but you don't want Jesus. And, and that's, that's been my experience. And um, the Dire of Ages, page 668, uh, we, we went over this. And if we consent, you have this quote in last week's. Um, he will so, that, that word is important, if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. If we come to him in faith, if we come to him in faith, he will speak his mysteries to us personally. This is talking about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And all we have to do is be willing to consent. So we come to the cross every morning of our lives and consent to be the dwelling place of the Son of God. I mean, how amazing is that? Um, before we move on, I want to point out all the benefits we have because of Jesus dying on the cross. It's workbook page two. This is the benefits of the death of Jesus. Through the death of Jesus Christ, um, I'm just going to read through the benefits and you guys can see the scripture relating to it there. I've been justified, declared righteous. I was reconciled to God. God has demonstrated his love toward me. God has made peace reconciling all things, including me to himself. I was redeemed, bought back, and forgiven. I was crucified with Christ. He became sin for me and died as me. My sin has been put or taken away. I have been released from my sins. I can consider myself to be dead to sin. I have no second death in my future. This is a reference to eternal death in contrast to physical death in the grave, when, which Jesus called sleep. I have been freed from my enemy, Satan. He's been defeated. He is powerless over me. I am free from the fear of death, from slavery to sin and the devil. I have been perfected forever, even while I'm in the process of being sanctified by Christ. I was healed. I am no longer condemned. So this verse is at the top of your workbook on page 3. John 5, 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my words and believes in him who sent me has, that's the big word, has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. And that's John 5, 24, Romans 8, 4, and 30. The word here that's important is has everlasting life. It's a present tense word. It's not you're going to have it because Jesus is the second coming. It's I have eternal life right now. I have eternal life. I have Jesus right now. You have eternal life right now. When you consent for the Son of God you to come and live in you, you have eternal life. You have it now. You have life and life more abundantly. And, um, and that, word pre that word walk is also a present tense because we can walk with God. He'll speak his mysteries to us personally. And we have it now through the death of Jesus. We have passed through death into life. There is no second death in our future because of Jesus. We all just, when we die, we just go to sleep. That's our experience. So this is also in the workbook, 1 John 4, 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. 
This is the, pro anyways, so uh, you can write down in your notes what verse I just referenced. It's John, 1 John 4, 15 and 16. It's a fairly well-known verse. It's 1 John 4, 15 to 16. Um, it's God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. God wants to be our dwelling place, uh, his dwelling place in us. And this is a promise of the Holy Spirit living in us. The Holy Spirit only abides in those who confess the Son of the living God. If we are not daily coming to the cross and confessing and Christ and boldly claiming Consider myself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. It doesn't have to be just this verse, but a verse like it where we are coming to the cross in the beginning of the day and asking to be filled with his spirit. We may have the wrong spirit. We may end up with the wrong bus driver. Trust me, my, my, bus, my bad bus driver and my good dri bus driver feel like they're fighting all day long, and I'm just, nope. I have six kids, you know. It's, it's, it's a character reformation for me. Um, we have been delivered from the excesses. Uh, oh yeah, we may have the wrong spirit. If we have been delivered from the excesses of Pentecostalism, where they want the excitement of a spirit, but they don't come by way of the cross. And you know, grace was not cheap. It cost the Son of God everything. And I want to make sure that I'm I'm not being miscommunicating. We are not to hold on to sin. But who helps, who gets rid of sin for us? Who gives us the victory? Jesus, and it's Christ. And he, when he comes living in us, things will start to go away. And if you're stressing, you know, I just not, you know, I stress. I'm a stressor. And I, I look at what I did. I pick over the day, and I'm like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. And I said this to my daughter, and I shouldn't have done that. And, you know, God wants to take that away from me also. But... I have to be patient and know that what God has declared righteous, He will make, He's going to work with me. He's patient. He's going to get these things. It's not overnight. This, the plant doesn't spring up from the seed immediately. It's not instantaneous. There's a process. And there have been times where I say, I, I don't want to get rid of that sin. I like this one. I think I'll hang on to this one. And that's our nature. I, I like sin. We all like sin. We are bent Iniquity is bent towards self. That's the sh picture of the, the shepherd's crook. We like it. I like it. And that's just how we're going to be. And that's not going to change until Christ comes a second time and corruption puts on incorruption. We're going to have a sin nature until Jesus arrives. Um, but I, I am bent towards sin. But God is going to indwell me. And he's going to slowly get rid of these things. And I need to have patience. So how do... <laughs> We have lots of food, guys. How do we know if we have the right spirit? So this is important. This is when we get into kind of our lesson. This is in your workbook, this quote from Ellen White. How do we know if we have the right spirit? Hi! <laughs> Ellen White here speaking of those who rejected the message in 1844. These are Adventists who rejected the message in 1844. I turned to look at the company who were still bowed before the throne. They did not know that Jesus had left they did not know that Jesus had left the throne. Satan appeared to be by the throne, trying to carry on the work of God. I saw them look up, breathe upon them, and I saw, whoops, I missed a line. I saw them look up to the throne and pray, Father, give us thy spirit. Satan would then breathe upon them an unholy influence. In it there was light and much power, but no sweet love, joy, and peace. Satan's object was to keep them deceived and to draw back and deceive God's children. That's early writings, page 56. I do not naturally have this love that I need. I am easily deceived by Satan because, you know, I can get going on the standards pretty quick with my kids. And, um, you know, I, I can be void, pretty void of love pretty quickly. And... Um, I'm just going to tell you a little story. You know, I was sitting in the chair at the salon getting my hair did, and God knocked on my mind, and, oops, I skipped. I'm not, I'm, tell, I'm trying to practice, like Nathan Renner taught me, just the bullet points. So I'm going without notes now. 
Um, so I was sitting in the hair, and I started talking to the hairstylist. They've got all the goods on everybody and all the, the dirt, you know. And I started telling her how uh, I was going to go to my son's graduation, and I was just going to give my ex, his baby daddy, the cold shoulder. Uh, you know, we've been through a lot, and I, that was it. Um, and so uh, I'm telling her this, and I get home that night, and I go to bed, and I get up in the middle of the night, and the Holy Spirit's just like, really? Really, you're going to go, and you're going to say all that, and you're going to you know, do all that, really? You haven't learned over these 18 years you know, that this doesn't work? And I felt really bad saying all that because I was not Christ-like. I got the wrong bus driver driving at that moment. <laughs> And so I uh, pray before I go to my son's graduation, um, because my son said to me, you know, Mom, I, I really hope you'll just sit with my dad and, you know, in other words, you know, be cool, stick together, because there's 500 kids graduating. He doesn't want to have to find Mom and then run to cross the, you know, on the other side, because we probably sit on opposite sides, you know, and we hadn't spoken in over a year, um, my baby daddy and I. And so um, he's like, Mom, sit, will you sit with my dad? And I, I said, sure, honey, just like it was no big thing. But really inside, I was like, oh, boy, because I, I knew what I wanted to say. You want to? I think I could cut, calm her down a little bit. Anyways, um, so I get to the gra before I get to the graduation, I pray, Lord, I need the right bus driver. <laughs> So I'm praying before I go to the graduation, you know, Lord, give me the right bus driver. And um, I get there, and all of a sudden, um, I feel my arms just, I go up to my baby daddy's new wife, never met her before, and I just, my arms open up, and I just gave her this big hug, and I'm going, whoa, you know, I can't believe I just did that. And I sit next to them the whole graduation, just like we have been, you know, friends all along. And I'm thinking, wow, that was really good. And so I pray, Lord, please give me $10 million. No, I, but that, that, the next prayer I was about to pray was as if I asked for $10 million. Because in my mind, after all the garbage we had been through, I mean, it was custody battle since my son was two years old. And um, unfortunately, this taught my son kind of some bad behaviors where he thought that if I tell my mom anything about my dad, she's going to use that to, you know, it's like a grenade to lob over to their side of the war. And um, I basically, um, I like I talk about in my book, um, I, one of the biggest regrets of my life is uh, fighting his father so viciously in the court system because it was like Solomon, the two mothers coming to Solomon saying, you know, this is my baby. No, this is my baby. And Solomon's like, well, I'll cut him in half. And the good mother says, no, wait. And the bad mother's like, sure, cut him in half. And I was the bad mother. I, I was perfectly happy to have my son cut in half for the sake of um, I wanted him to be with me. And so I, we, we, we battled it out. And it, it didn't work well because we ended up hating each other. And my son was really, you know, down, you know this really hurt my son because of that. And so... I just, I just, after the graduation, it was so nice getting along, and it was so lovely. And I just said, Lord, if you could just please heal this relationship. And I uttered that prayer, and then I totally forgot about it. I totally forgot about it. And uh, through a series of events, a week or two weeks after, my son goes to boot camp, and I get a text from my baby daddy's wife, never heard from her before, don't even know what the number is. And I text her back, can I call you? And I didn't wait for the answer, I just called her. And I called her and I shared with her how my biggest regret in life is fighting with my son's father and just, the, just how terrible I felt about that and how wrong I had been. And would you please forgive me? And she was just, you know, and then the next thing I know, I'm with this, you know, nice bus driver on board. I say, I love you guys. And I'm like, wow, you know, because this is not me. And she's like, we love you too. And I'm, if you would have told me three weeks ago that I'd be standing up here and I would have gotten a text and exchanging text every single week since my son had been left for boot camp with my baby daddy and his wife, I would have said, you're nuts. You don't know all the dynamics of the situation. You don't know all the walls that I've put up and he's put up. You just don't know. 
I would have said, you're nuts, you're crazy. But here, here I am standing and telling you that this relationship has been healed. And when God gives us his spirit and God puts the right bus driver on board, and it, it will give us beautiful things. We'll have miracles that we wouldn't otherwise have. Relationships will heal that were otherwise broken. Miracles will happen that we couldn't even conceive of. Um, the Desire of Ages says the greatest miracle is a changed life. And that's what living in the Spirit will do for us. That's what putting the right bus driver will do. Um, putting the right bus driver in the driver's seat means a walk with God. Uh, when we walk in the Spirit and look at Jesus, this is when we will live with His agape love. And this is when we will glorify the Father because we have evidence that we've been with Jesus. Um, before I close, I want to share a story of what it means to walk with Jesus. Um, every day of our walk is dependent on the established fact of justification. If we don't understand justification, it's going to mess up all the rest of the process. Um, it means to be declared righteous. Is it works? No, it's freedom. Are we free because of anything we've done? Nope. I'm still wretched, poor, miserable, blind, and naked. I'm still very capable of going and messing up my relationship with my baby daddy today. I could just totally mess it up. Um, it all is dependent on Christ living in me. Um, I'm going to share a story back in Roman times. At any given time during, in the population of Rome, 40 to 60 <clears> percent <throat> were slaves. Um, and uh, this. I'm going to go again without notes because I need to practice. So this, this uh, Roman slave was standing up on the podium, and the auctioneer uh, was pointing to everybody on you know, how strong he was and all the work you'll get from him. And the slave is saying, I'm not going to work for you. I will not work for you. And the auctioneer kicks him and says, you know, shut your mouth, keep quiet. And there's a farmer in the back, and he s starts the bid high, and he just drives the price up just bidding for this slave. And the slave is saying to the farmer, I am not going to work for you. I will not work for you. I will not work. And uh, finally, the farmer pays the you know, highest price for the slave. And the auctioneer gives the uh, farmer the chains to pull the slave off and away. And um, the slave is the whole time is uttering, I will not work for you. I won't work for you. And the farmer gets a little ways from the crowd, and the auctioneer had given him the key. And he gets away from the people, and he unlocks the slave's shackles and removes the chains. And, and the slave is still saying, will not work for you. And the farmer says, I did not work for you. I did not buy you to have you work for me. I bought you to set you free. And the slave falls on his knees in tears, and he said, I'll work for you all my life. That's... That's the difference. This is the gospel. The highest price has been paid for us, not to make us slaves of fear or slaves of sin, but to set us free. So one last thing before we pray, uh, if you look at your bookmarks and what this evening is all about, is living in the present tense with heaven or glory in our hearts. It should be a present circumstance I just want to say a word about the work mark you have in front of you. Um, this is such a significant passage. What we read here is now to become a part of our daily experience. You've come to the cross. You've confessed your belief in the death of Jesus. You have claimed the privilege of being justified, declared righteous, forgiven, reconciled, all the beautiful benefits we have outlined in your workbook through the death of Jesus. Now and make sure you're reading and understanding this passage clearly. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. It's the reception of the Holy Spirit. This verse is the reception of the Holy Spirit coming into our lives that makes all of this possible. So now we can claim verse 11 for ourselves every day. Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is the faith step that you take after you've been to the cross and you've thanked God for how generous he's been through the death of Jesus. You are now privileged, and notice that here Paul himself goes here, to count yourself to be dead to sin. 
It has nothing to do with how you're feeling or how I'm feeling. We may actually be really struggling with sin and feeling trapped by sin when we say this. We may actually be really tempted when we say this. We may be feeling drawn out to sin when we say this. This isn't feelings. It's a faith step. You consider yourself to be dead to sin. I certainly thank God for this myself. Having looked at the death of Jesus and praised God for that, I then take this step and I say, thank you, God, because today I consider myself to be dead to sin. And I also consider myself to be alive to God. I'm your child today. You're his child today. And as I leave home, doing this in the morning, what do I need to go about my day? And what do I need to be able to function, to be dead to sin and alive to God? What am I going to need for this new day, this new life? I'm going to need the Holy Spirit, the, the good bus driver. I like to reinforce this with God every day. I, I say this every morning. That as a child of God who's no longer a slave to sin, but now instead is free, a free child of the heavenly God, I need the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in order to function and live through another day so that I may glorify my Father, which is the purpose, and this is peace with God. This is what it means to have peace with God. It has nothing to do with how we feel. So I'm going to close now. We're going to close with prayer, and we're going to pray for that. And then the wind's going to come. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I would, you know. I wish, you know, we can all hope. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all the benefits that we get from your death and that we don't have to die the second death. And Lord, I pray right now for myself and for everybody else here, Lord, that we consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And we pray, Lord, for your good bus driver to take over our hearts and minds because we can't drive the bus. We'll crash it. I know I'll crash it. Lord, we just pray for your Holy Spirit and for your agape love. And thank you, Lord, for this class and these wonderful people that have come. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, so that was week six. So come back August 28th. We'll be starting from the very beginning, from the very beginning, the bedrock of the definition of sin. And it's going to be really good. We're going to do, we're going to bring it about to the Christ righteousness every single time because that's what... That's what's going to really get our church on fire. That's what's going to change people. That's what's going to, you know, that's what's going to make people say, you know, you can mess up and say something you didn't mean to say to someone. If you can say, you know, I really shouldn't have said that to you. I really shouldn't have done that. I, I hope I show my kids every single day that mom is a wreck. Uh, they're going to, it's not if they make a mistake, it's when they make a mistake. And that when they make a mistake, I'm teaching them, does it? You've got to turn to Jesus. He's the only, if you make a mistake and you've got the wrong bus driver going, just turn to your father and tell him, I need this right bus driver. I don't want to have this thought anymore. I don't want to have this anymore. Lord, take it from me. Give me your bus driver. And I'm just seeing that my children, you know, they're, they're, they're joyful. You know, children are always joyful. But I want them to know that if they make a mistake in life, that Jesus will, will can, still, can still come in. He'll always come in. His grace, we learn, is poured out on the weak, the, the ungodly. That's the conditions for being your grace to be poured out. Who needs his grace? We all need his grace. And so I hope you guys come uh, next, this fall. I'm looking forward to it.